But this is going to be an interesting talk, by the way, and at least exciting for me, because uh, my, my laptop is completely broken, and if I open the lid too much, it will just turn itself off. So I'm going to have to low code for you now with the laptop slightly folded down and just pray that it doesn't wiggle too much and, and everything goes blank. So that happens, at least you know what, what, what's going on there. And if that happens, probably the talk's gone to shit already, so let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, anyway, uh, following up on the, on the theme of, um, of JavaScript and, and JavaScript frameworks, now, um, of course, for a hipster developer, JavaScript is starting to exhibit certain problems because what does a hipster want? What is really the definition of a hipster? Anybody got a suggestion? And don't say moustaches. Well, no, I think, you know, with, with the whole thing about, um, you know, you can't listen to mainstream music if you want to be a credible hipster and all that. Why, why, why uh, do they actually listen to these undiscovered bands and all that? It's because they want to feel superior to you guys who listen to you know, pop music and, and other wretched mainstream rubbish. And as a hipster developer, I mentioned JavaScript is starting to develop certain issues in that sense. Especially now, um, it was great to have a talk about Angular introducing, well, previous to this talk, because it, it shows you kind of part of the problem, because Angular is a framework, and it's got dependence injection, right? Yeah, dependence injection. And um, what it doesn't do, though, is, is object orientation much. Am I, am I right in that assumption? Okay, so it's it's at least not that <laughs> often, yeah. But uh, I, I've seen a bit of Ember, and that's object orientation all the way. And so we've got object orientation, we've got frameworks, we've got dependence injection, all that. What does that remind you of? Enterprise development. It, it, it's not well suited to make you feel superior to other developers. It's, it's actually kind of turning you into them, and, and, and you know we honestly can't just turn mainstream just like that. That would be appalling. Uh, of course, the best thing to be, um, if you want to be a hipster developer and feel superior to everybody else, is you want to get into functional programming because that stuff, that is the hard, hardcore stuff. Like you've got your closely arrows or your needle lemmas. Coburitas, of course, and psychohistomorphic prepromorphisms. How can you not tell somebody and throw the word psychohistomorphic prepromorphism casually into, into a conversation about programming and not feel smug and superior about it? It's amazing. Um, problem is you don't see much, too much of it in JavaScript. Fortunately, this is sort of changing now. I mean, you've you got all your angulars and numbers and... and, and backbone still, I think. And, uh, but there's also a bit of functional programming sneaking in. Well, you've got React.js, by the way. That's sort of aiming to do the same thing as Angular. I'm, I'm going to be using a bit of React, but mostly just as a very simple renderer. What I'm more concerned with is this thing called functional reactive programming. Actually, uh, functional reactive programming is a very specific term in computer science. It was inv invented by this guy called Colin Elliott, and <coughs> he's, been, he's been raging on the internet at people writing allegedly functional reactive libraries and calling them functional reactive because he says that they're really not. Um, they might be reactive, and they might be functional, but they're not functional reactive, if you see what I mean. Um, though, we have a, a particular implementation of reactive programming that I'd like to talk about uh, tonight and, and show you um, some code um, using it. There is reactive extensions, which started in C Sharp, invented by this guy here called Eric Meyer, who wears these t-shirts all the time, um, and who is, a, who is an academic, though he's been working for Microsoft for several years, and hence the C Sharp thing. This reactive extensions thing, though, turned out to be a very good idea. 
So it's slowly been spreading out to other platforms and other languages, um, including JavaScript. We got this library called RxJS, which is the JavaScript implementation of reactive extensions. Um, it was not written by David Heinemeyer Hansen. He's just there to, because I had to use a picture there, right? And he's, he invented Rails, so he must be a great guy. I think he also killed TDD now, didn't he? Very, very enterprising fellow. Um, anyway, um, I mentioned I'm, I'm also going to be using a bit of React.js. React.js is aiming to do sort of the same thing as, as Angular, except it's more lightweight and it's more focused on just the, um, the, the view part of the MSE thing. Um, I'm just going to be using a very small part of React, which is the, um, the rendering component. So I'm essentially just going to be using React to, to construct DOM elements for me. So I'm not going to be focusing too much on that. But I'm going to put React and Reactive Extensions together. Um, very confusing to name, aren't they? They're separate things. Um, and I'm going to make a game out of that. So I think let's just get to it. I'm actually going to show you just a little bit of how Reactive Extensions works, the, but the plumbing of it. So. Pray for my laptop lid to stay put. So, reactive extensions uh, deals with this, this concept called an observable, which is sort of um, a stream. Uh, I know you don't know no JS. A couple. And in Node.js, um, they're very fond of their streams. Though these particular streams are normally used for, for um, binary data or streams of, of bias or characters. Um, an Rx observable is sort of the same thing, except it's not necessarily a character. It can be, but it can be anything. It's just expected that probably the same thing tends to come out. Though given JavaScript being not a type language, that is entirely up to you. But when there's data, there's an item of something, a value, um, coming out of the stream. So the stream is asynchronous. It's also sort of like a JavaScript array in that it lets you do things like map and filter and, and so on on it. And in fact, you can construct these observables from arrays like this one here with ponies in it. I thought I'd start off like with ponies because who doesn't like ponies? So what I would normally do is if I want to get to what's in this, I would use the subscribe method, which I could, which takes a function, which gets um, one element of this observable for each element there is, as they appear. And incidentally, I should warn you, I'm using ECMAScript 6, so this is actually a function. Life's too short to actually type out the function keyword. So, we could go like console.log <coughs> pony, and that will actually print this to my console. But my console is not visible, and we got this great picture of David Heinemeyer Hansen on the right hand here. So I figured, let's do something a little more interesting with that. I have this, I added this little function to the observable called log, which simply outputs the ponies on top of David. So there we go. That gets us all six ponies. You can only see 5.2 of them on this screen, but trust me, they're all, they're all there. And we can go on. We can add a filter to that. Well, actually, let's add a map to that. Um, the map function, in case you don't know it, um, applies a function to each element in the array or, or the observable on the stream or whatever you, you like to call it. So essentially, we can pass it a function that takes a pony and it returns, I love said pony. And as you can see, that changes the value. And we can keep putting things onto this stream so suppose you only like ponies whose name ends with an E. T 
Do you like my contrived examples? Um, e dollar uh, test, isn't it? I know exact works, but I think test is what is the base of time. So test that against the pony, and if this regular expression matches, that returns a truthy value, which means the filter function is going to include the pony. And if it returns uh, null, in case of no match, uh, the pony is going to be filtered out, which is very handy because Fluttershy's name does not end with an E, and we don't really want Fluttershy in, in, inside a string of ponies that we love because she's kind of rubbish. <laughs> so. This gets us only Twilight Sparkle and Pinkie Pie. And you'll notice that these ponies have names ending with an E. And we can go on. Actually, what I'm going to do now is, so this essentially is exactly the same as JavaScript arrays. Nothing interesting so far. But I mentioned these are asynchronous. And let's see if I can remember this one from scratch, because I forgot to take notes here. Uh, what I want to do is I want to, actually, 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 oh, wait. I wanted to show you something else as well. So instead of the ponies, I can make, I got um, an Rx observable factory function here called interval. And interval takes a number of milliseconds. And what it does is essentially it yields a value every and milliseconds. So if I slap a log onto that, what I'll see is a number that increases every 500 milliseconds. This is going to go on forever, unless I tell it to stop. I think, is it safe to refresh? Just, this is just literally the only way to stop the stream. Uh, I could go like, you've got a lot of methods in these observables. I could go take only the first five and log that. And these, um, these create new streams. So the interval is still going to be there. And take five creates a new stream that only takes the first five elements of interval and log then logs them, obviously. And that yields, as you would expect, it stops after four. And while the interval goes on forever, if there's nothing listening to it. It gets garbage, garbage collected. So once take five is no longer interested, after having taken five, uh, the interval stops. The interval stream stops. Now let's put them together. Let's see if I can remember this bit. What I want to do is another factory function called zip. Zip takes uh, any number of, of these observables and waits until each of them has yielded one element then outputs that, um, well, passes that through a function that you can use to select which one you're interested in or do anything to it, really. Um, whenever all the streams you pass in have yearly one element, you get an element out of the zip. So let us try. I'm not at all sure I can remember, remember this. We want the interval. 500, because what, what I want to do here is I want to take the list of ponies, and I want one pony every half second. So the idea is I zip that up with an interval, because the zip waits for both streams to yield a value, and I add ponies to that. And as I said, there's got to be a selector function. The selector function, if I recall this correctly, is going to be passed each of the values as an argument. So the i from interval and the pony from ponies. And of course, I'm only interested in the pony. And let's look at that. I'm not sure if this is going to work. I can't actually think when I'm presenting. But it works. We get one pony every five seconds every 500 milliseconds, sorry. And we can go on. I got this one here. This is exactly the same thing I wrote um, on the previous slide, except now I'm applying it to pony time instead. So it should have the same effect, filtering and then adding 
our sentiments about the remaining ponies. But it's going to happen every tick, every 500 milliseconds. And you'll notice because of the filter function, um, some ticks won't have ponies in them. See that? But I guess it's the same result as previously. We still get Twilight Sparkle and Pinkie Pie, but only as they happen, as they come out of the, of the zip. So that was my gentle introduction to RX with ponies. Now let's actually write a game. So what I'm planning to write is slightly inspired by Robot Unicorn Attack. Anybody play that? You know, with um, the robot unicorn that just keeps running forever in, into your dreams. Except, of course, robot unicorns are boring now, so I'm just going to use a pony. But we're getting to that. I want ground, and I want the ground to move. And because I can't let this get too complicated, the ground is going to be continuous. In robot unicorn attack, you have to jump. Uh, across gaps in the ground and, and it changes elevation and you have to keep jumping. But my plane is just going to run. And I'm going to add in some elements to make it interesting. I'm going to add uh, things that you need to catch and I'm going to add obstacles if there's time. Um, I've written some codes here to get me started. Uh, essentially, the thing on the right is just uh, an HTML document. and. I've added some background to it, and I'm going to keep adding DOM elements using React. Um, the ground is going to be a DOM element, the pony is going to be a DOM element, obstacles, and so on. Um, so what I got here is a very, because I do want to remain functional here, I've got a very quick and dirty um, implementation of um, immutable data structures. Essentially, I've got a way to make copies of, of uh, JavaScript objects and change them. Because um, in functional programming, of course, you can't have mut mutable state. That would be very bad. So what comes out of, of our um, Rx uh, observables, we can't change that. We have to make copies and, and pass them on. So extend and associate do that. Associate is the interesting one. As this essentially takes um, an object I want to extend. I should have actually probably called that extend. Um, and then another object that gets merged into it. It's sort of like the thing that you find in an underscore. But anyway, it's not too important. On screen is a function that simply tests whether a DOM element or a, a coordinate pair is uh, on screen inside the, the little skybox. And bind key is a quick function I write using the mousetrap library, which lets me get uh, an Rx stream of key presses. So for instance, I can go bind key space, and it will give me um, an observable that yields space every time I press the space bar, which is going to be um, our only control. Um, the only thing the pony can do in this game is jump. And by pressing space, the pony jumps. So let's get started. Um, I want to represent the ground using, well, I want to represent, I'm going to, you need to shout out if I go too far down the screen and you can't see because I'm in the way or something. Um, feel free to interrupt if that happens. Also, if you see me making a typo or a mistake of any kind, it is your duty to tell me so. And if I screw up, that is because of you. <laughs> Exactly, if I, if I fold my screen too far out, that's all on me. So let's go. I said I wanted to, re to represent all elements by basic JavaScript um, objects. And I figured I represent the ground in this case as, sorry, silly, use this keyboard. Um, I want something that has an ID. This ID is going to be essentially the class name, the DOM class name, CSS class, if you like. And so it should be called ground. It's going to have an X and a Y coordinate. So X is 0, Y is, stop that, Y is 0. 
And also, I want to add some trick right here because it's going to be a little easier to think about our objects if they have a specified uh, origo. Like x, x and y being zero has means a particular position that isn't necessarily zero in the, in the document. So I'm going to add something called base x and base y. In the case of the ground, I want, I want to, because the, the texture is, is going to be bigger than the screen, I want to start with a little bit of screen. And the idea is I have um, a ground image, a PNG essentially, that is about twice the size of the screen. And I'm just going to scroll it. And then when it reaches, when it almost reaches the end, I'm going to have, have it just flip back to the starting position and keep looping over that to create the illusion that the ground is, is moving infinitely along. Um, so like this-ish. So this is going to be, you need to sort of remember this structure because this is going to be how I represent every game object. I'm essentially going to be creating these um, the simple JavaScript objects, and I'm going to pass them to the render function and have them rendered by React. So I should create that render function. I'm going to call it make element node. Uh, the node in question is something that looks like this. And it should return a react.dom.div. That's going to create a div element. Ah, that's my semicolon. And the div element has a class name which is identical to node.id. And it has a style which contains left. This is um, essentially CSS. Uh, it's going to be like domnode.style.left should be like this. and. It's going to be node.x plus, you remember node.baseX. Actually, I'm going to make that optional. So node.baseX, or where's the pipe? There's the pipe. Or zero, if that doesn't exist. And so. I also want, this might not be an integer, this might be, this might have a decimal point and everything. And there's this great, apparently very efficient, hackish way of, of casting that into an integer in JavaScript, which is just uh, pipe zero. Math.floor would be essentially doing the same thing, except it's apparently less performant. I learned this at JSConf, where you learn amazing things about things you don't really want to know anything about. Um, so this gets us the x coordinate. Oops. And I'm going to be using essentially the same thing for the y coordinate. So I'll make a copy top and node at y and node at base y and pixels. Does that look right to you? Okay. So that gets us a React DOM object, which represents a div. And now we need a render function for that. Render scene. It takes a list of nodes, uh, these kinds of nodes, React nodes. Oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. It takes a list of my nodes, and it returns react.render component which takes, I want a div acting as um, the container for all the other nodes. And I am going to take my list of nodes and map them through my make element function, which is going to take my object nodes like this and turn it into divs like this. And they're all going to be inside this div. And I'm going to put this div 
into my canvas, which is this. It's just an element that I get by ID, which is actually the one that you're seeing there with the, the sky over Ponyville as a background. So that's our render function. Semicolon there. You should have warned me about that. Douglas Crockford might have killed me if he'd known. Um, right. So let's get the ground in. See if we can make this just work. So if I call render scene, taking just the, oh, it takes a list of elements, a list of nodes containing only ground, that should actually render the ground. It's going to render it anywhere reasonable, I wonder. No. You what? Yes. I what? Oh, no, I have. I have. Um, what render component does is it, it takes um, a React DOM element and it takes where to put it. So this should hopefully put it where it's supposed to be. And that being the ground, it also should be a little further down. 384. I could put it in base Y, but I don't really need base Y for this. I'm doing base X. We're getting to that. And there's a the ground. Now it doesn't move, does it? So I'm going to create an Rx observable that makes it move. Ground stream is Rx observable, as promised. Um, dot interval. Remember that? And I want this to be moving at 33 milliseconds, every 33 milliseconds, which if you do the, some quick math, it's going to get you, is it 25 or 30? 30, 30, yeah, uh, frames per second. So uh, this is essentially going to create a stream that ticks up, starts at zero, and every 33 milliseconds, it ticks up one. And I am going to map that into a function that takes this number x, and returns a node exactly like this. In fact, I'm just going to move this up here and get rid of this. And I am going to do something useful, useful with that x coming in. I'm going to, this is going to get mathsy. Hold on. Uh, x modulo 64 multiplied by negative 8. That gets me, that should get me something that moves by 8 pixels every frame in that direction. And when it's moved, in that direction for 64 frames, it's going to loop around. That's what the modulator does. So I'm going to just uh, take advantage of the fact that this texture is like a little more than twice the size of the screen. I'm going to move it back until we almost re reach the end of it, and then I'm going to pop it back and, 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 and keep looping. So let's see if that works. Semicolon there, of course. And we are going to have to update our rendering, a call to the render function here. Um, because now we have a stream out of which a, a node comes, and we want to render that node every time it updates. And we also want that in a list. So there happens to be a function called zip array. Which is also going to prove useful when we add more nodes to this game than just the ground, or it wouldn't be very exciting. Um, so ZipArray essentially takes any number of, of Rx um, observables, and it turns it into a single stream that contains the elements from all these streams in an array. And an, an array of nodes is coincidentally exactly what our render scene function does. 
So let's start it off with ground stream. So all we got so far. And we subscribe to that. And um, when there's an element out of this uh, zipped stream, we just call render scene on that. And that should do it, hopefully. It does. Ooh. Right now, I am more relieved than you can know. <laughs> so, OK, where's the pony? We need a pony. Um, so I was talking about the pony being able to jump. So I'm going to start this off with creating a stream that this gets a little bit tricky. So the bind key function that I told you about earlier takes a description of the key that it should listen for, space. And this now produces uh, an Rx stream. Every time I press space, there's going to come a string out of this stream, which is space. And I can buffer that. This is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, so that every time another stream that I'm going to pass to, to, to the buffer function um, yields something, um, it's going to take everything that's come out of the bind key stream so far as an array and yield that, which is a trick. And I'm going to explain to you what, what actually comes out of this. Interval 33, once again. So I'm buffering this through um, a 30 FPS uh, window. So if I press base like five times in 33 milliseconds, what's going to come out here is a list of five spaces. And if I don't press space at all, what's going to come out is an empty list. But every 33 milliseconds, something's going to come out. And that's going to be um, the stream that renders our pony. Because what we can do to this now is, is map a function over it that essentially creates our pony. Uh, I'm going to reuse tick. So I'm just going to assign it to something. Note the letter, by the way, not the var that you might be used to in JavaScript. I said this was ECMAScript 6. And the let is exactly like the var, except it is differently scoped. Because JavaScript scoping is, is, JavaScript is function scope, not block scope. And everybody hates that. So in ES6, they're adding uh, block scope if you use let instead of r. And it makes absolutely no practical difference at all in this case, but it's there, so let's do it. Let's live dangerously. Um, now, let us make a pony or a stream yielding a pony. Pinky stream is uh, tick. And I'm going to use the scan function here. The scan function is tricky. Scan is sort of like reduce, except it yields something every iteration. And what that means is, essentially, I'm going to create a sort of a game loop just for the pony in here. Um, the scan function takes, first of all, it takes an initial value. And the initial value is going to be a node. The node is going to be called pinky. I think you see where I'm going with this. And base y is going to be about where I want the pony to be on the ground. So that um, it's going to be a hell of a lot easier to do our calculations if we know that the y coordinate 0 means the pony is on the ground. And by trial and error, I found this to be 276, the optimal value. Uh, starting x coordinate is going to be 0. And y coordinate is 0, which now means 206, 20, 276. Sorry. And I'm also going to add some, some more items to this object, because the pony can have a velocity. When she's jumping, she has an upwards velocity. That, and then you apply gravity to it, and eventually it turns into downwards velocity. So I'm going to call that vx. And by. They both start at 0. And I'm just going to add this thing. 
that we might not even have time to get to, just so I won't forget. I want the game over flag. If we get as far as the game over condition. Uh, actually got very little time left, but we'll see. So, <laughs> good God, I'm, I'm 30 minutes into the talk and we haven't even got a pony yet, so I should pick up the pace. But Paul did tell me to do the uh, introduction so I'll blame him if we, we don't get to the end, don't worry. It's never my fault, at least. Um, and the scan function, um, as I said, it takes an initial value, uh, this object, and it takes a function, which gets called every iteration with the current value, which is going to be the initial value first. And its, its task is to return an updated value, which is then passed in through that function again for the next iteration and so on. And that value is also being yielded by the observable. So this gives us a, a neat little mini game loop for the pony. Um, the pony, I'm going to call it P, if that's fine with you. And I'm going to get keys as well, aren't I? No, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, I'm going to get keys. Um, so the function takes two arguments. Um, the first is the value that we're operating on, and the second is, where's my cursor? Is what comes out of tick, which remember we are scanning. And that happens to be our list of keys being pressed. So, let us implement this. Uh, so first of all, um, we should be applying velocity. So P is velocity of P. And you might be able to tell that we don't have the velocity function, so I'm going to write that. I'm going to be using this for every object, so I'm, I want this as a function. Velocity of note is implementation for that. Um, it returns that as those function I was talking about at the start of node and the, the updated values for node. It creates a copy of node and updates these values. x should be node x plus node dot vx. And so you might suspect now that y is going to be node y plus node dot. I'm checking if you're paying attention. VI, yeah, of course. Terribly uncomplicated, just applies the velocity to the current coordinate. And it also happens to get us a fresh copy of P that we can change to our heart's content inside this function. Once it comes out of the function, though, um, the laws of functional programming say that we are not allowed to change it, which is the point of making a copy in the first place, because we can't change the P that comes in. We're just reassigning it here. And so let us apply gravity. Actually, let's render this pony, first of all. Just return p. Let's just see that the pony shows up at all. So adding this to the game is now going to be very simple. I'm just going to add pinker stream to the zip array. And that breaks. Reference error, node is not defined. Excuse me, oh, sorry. Why didn't you spot that? You are very poor compilers. Now, there's a pony, woo! Now, let us apply gravity. Uh, let us, um, let us increase Vx by 0.98. That's gravity, right? Just an arbitrary number. It could really be anything. It affects the speed. One might have been easier. But I did do the master of all thing earlier just because of this. 0.98. This is real physics. Woo! We won! Correct! Well spotted. And now, of course, she just falls through the ground. So we need to make a stop when she hits the ground. Actually, I am going to try and do some BDD for you now. 
Um, so essentially, as Pinkie Pie, given that I'm falling, um, sorry, when I hit the ground, then I stop. So how to implement that if p dot y is greater than or equal to zero, that means either she's on the ground or below it, and p dot vi is greater, vy, sorry, is greater than zero, that means she's moving downwards, then p dot y should be zero, which means on the ground. Uh, no. yeah. Less than zero is going to be above the ground, okay. because of course this uh, is this is the dom and the origin is, is right on top. Um, B dot B I should also be zero because she stops. So now she stays on the ground, but gravity is being applied. She just doesn't fall through the ground. So let's see if we can make a jump. So if she's in, if, if space is being pressed, that would, we assume now that um, the user never presses anything but space. So the list of keys coming in, I just check the first one. And if that happens to be space, then we assume that it's been pressed. Also, unless you mash really fast, then you probably won't get more than one space. So this should be fine. Oh, wow, <laughs> yes. Actually, tri triple equals, yeah. So uh, then p dot vi, vy. I keep saying vi, is that like a Freudian slip? I'm an Emacs user normally. Uh, then, so if space is pressed, then upwards velocity to 20, which means she can now jump. And she falls down and soaps. She can actually keep jumping while in the air. And she can just jump forever. <laughs> and eventually, I think she's going to come back down. There she goes. Yeah. So this is a problem, obviously. We need to make sure that she can only jump when she's on the ground. So if p dot y uh, is 0, then she's allowed to jump. Otherwise, she is not. So that should do it. And also, while we're at it, let's add some sound. Oh, no, we didn't have sound, do we? Oh, never mind. I got this amazing little Mario sam sample that I normally put in here. But I'm afraid you won't be able to hear it. So let's skip the sound. It's a shame, but there we go. So now she jumps, and I mash space, and she only actually jumps when she is on the ground. OK, I think. I think I'm actually supposed, I was supposed to stop my timer. I was about to tell me when I'm out of time. But um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and I'm going to add some, some coins for you. Um, so I, I figured, since I got the Mario samples, I can't show you and everything, um, let's have some, some, some coins and good Mario sign coming in and you have to collect them. So we are going to need to make another stream. And I'm going to create an initial coin node. Uh, ID coin. And velocity x is going to be minus 6. This is going to be fixed. It's just going to move across the screen at a regular pace. And it starts way off screen, 1,600 pixels. And it's just below the top of the screen. So she has to jump to catch the coin, so it, it will be way too easy. Uh, so this is the initial value for every coin. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a stream that, that creates this coin and, and loops it back if it goes off, off screen or if the pony catches it. So coin stream. You are? Minus 40. No. No, no, no. Um, no, um, the pony. It, 
the pen is, is above ground when she is negative because of the base y value. And this one doesn't have one. I never changed the y value, so, well, I, I might actually. We'll see. So, the coin, though, um, Pinkie Pie is going to affect the coin. If she touches it, then it changes the coin's behavior. So, I'm going to plug Pinkie's stream into the coin. And I'm going, going to do a scan on that, which means that I can, in the coin's uh, logic function, I can check where Pinkie is on screen because I want to see if she touches the coin. So this scan takes initial coin as initial value, and it takes a function um, that gets coin and pinky. And this line is getting long, isn't it? I'm about to break it. There we go. So this function, I'm going to break it right here. That helps. So this function takes um, the coin value and Pinky's value. And we start off by doing velocity again. Velocity of C. So that applies the movement to the coin and creates a new coin object as per usual. And if C dot B I V Y is zero because what I want the coin to do is when Pinky touches it, I want the coin to move upwards like in Mario uh, instead of moving, um, continuing to move to the left. So I'm essentially using the, the upwards velocity as a, a check to see if that has happened yet. If Vy is zero, that means it hasn't, and I should check if Pinky has collided with it. Now, I have cheated a little bit. I've created an intersect function here because it's just so boring to type. What it does is it takes two of these nodes that we've been using, in this case, C and Pinky, and it returns true if they are intersecting. Um, so if this actually happens, let's move a bit further up the screen, then here's where I would play this, this amazing Super Mario coin sound, of course, if we had sound. Let's just assume there is one. And as well, um, let us stop the x velocity of the coin and get it moving off screen. We're going to start at uh, noting one. And we're going to add some logic here. If it is moving already, because I want, I want the velocity to, to increase over time, we start at just one pixel per frame. And every frame where this is happening, if the, the y velocity is less than 0, that means it is happening, um, then we double that, multiply by 2. And finally, oh, semicolon here. This could have gone so wrong. I know JavaScript doesn't require them, but Douglas Crockford does, and I'm afraid of him. So if it's still on screen, then there's a question mark on this stupid keyboard. I just recently decided to change keyboard layouts. I'm using American keyboards now. Don't ask me why. I, can't, I, I often can't find keys. It's especially confusing because I changed from a UK layout to a US layout, and this keyboard is Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> right, so if it is still on screen, then just return, um, keep returning C. Otherwise, let's restart initial coin. You remember initial coin up there? There it is. So essentially, it will keep going left until it goes off screen, and then it restarts. Or if Pinky touches it, then it goes <coughs> off screen off the top and then eventually restarts. So let's see if we got coins. Oh, no, no. What did I forget to do? I need, I need to add the stream. Coin stream. OK. There she jumps. The coin is not appearing, is it? Oh, there we are. Woo. It's a Dogecoin. <laughs> Who knew? And we caught it. We're 
pretty rich now. Dogecoin is worth a lot of one of these days. Like 0. 0.0001 pounds. Actually, less than that. <laughs> so that's a game. So I'm actually out of time, and I would end there. Uh, unless somebody tells me there's time to add the obstacle as well. That was an alarm, was it? I need to get off stage now. Paul. Huh? How long do you need? About the same as the coin. Sorry? About the same as, as it took to add the coin. A couple of minutes, I think. Okay. So I figured that, you know, you know people are like my little pony. There's, they encounter a lot of haters on the internet because apparently liking my little pony isn't cool. So I thought I'd, I'd add a hater that you have to avoid. You have to essentially, it's going to come along the ground and you have to jump over him so you don't have to confront his hate. Um, you what? Jump on them. Jump on them. That, yeah. We're going to need more than a couple of minutes to do that. So let's just avoid them. So this is where the game overstate comes in. And so you remember that the coin, pinky affects the coin. The coin does not affect pinky. Uh, this is very fortunate because when things start affecting each other, you have to have a more advanced game loop. Uh, the hater affects pinky, but fortunately, pinky does not affect the hater. The hater just keeps going. Um, if Pinky touches him, but, but for Pinky, it's game over. The hater doesn't care. Um, so what I need to do then is I'm going to have to put the hater's stream into Pinky's stream. But first, let's create the hater's stream. It is very simple. I'm going to copy the initial coin. But because of JavaScript reasons, I'm going to have to put it above um, Pinky. There we go, and I'm going to change this to hater. Oops, initial hater. Hater. And it's going to move slightly faster. It's going to start at the same x coordinate, and it's going to be on the ground, which happens to be 300. Uh, and then I'm going to copy the coin stream because it's going to be essentially the same thing. And there's the hater. So, hater stream. X, no, wait a minute, this isn't the same thing at all, is it? I'm going to connect it to tick because it's conveniently going to tick every, um, 30, every 30 FPS. I don't care about uh, the key press in this case. But that's fine, I don't need to listen to it. Yeah, actually, this is H and don't care. H is velocity H. And that's it. To be honest, I am going to reuse this. Just going to change it to H. So the same logic with the off-screen thing. Initial hater. And so as far as the hater is concerned, that's all it needs. It just needs to be added to this one. And really, that should get the haters started. So the haters going to show up before the coin. There it comes. <laughs> evil, evil hater. Uh, of course, a pinky just runs straight through it because we haven't added the logic for that. Uh, let's do that. So instead of listening to tick, we are going to listen to an observable zip array of tick and hater stream because we need both. We now need both to, um, is it safe to break it here? I think so. We now need both the tick and the hater stream to decide what Pinky does. So, very quickly because I want to actually have to leave in an hour, and I want to go to the pub with you, so I should hurry. If intersects uh, p and hater, essentially if pinky collides with the hater, then pinky dot game over, for one thing, is true. And pinky dot id, this is the, the CSS class of the pinky DOM element. Is now not just pinky, but pinky game 
game over. Which reminds me, I should have been changing her, her animation when she jumps as well, but okay, never mind. At least uh, adding the game over class, because uh, Pinky's graphic is essentially decided by her CSS class. It's just a CSS background. So adding game over changes her to a different animation, um, which I have defined in the CSS. Of course, I would play some audio at this point, the Super Mario game over sound. Can't do that, sadly. Breaks my heart. But I'm going to add some peculiar physics here. When, when she goes into game over, she's going to sort of jump off the ground a bit slower, like Mario does, and she's going to fall down through the ground. So I'm going to start her off at an upwards velocity of minus 15. And if we're in the game over state, so this is, this strikes me as wrong. Isn't she going to keep intersecting the hater? I would want to move this up, sorry. So this gets us into the game over state, but if we are in the game over state, uh, the, the whole logic of Pinky changes. She only plus equals 0.5. So the gravity is lessened because she's going to jump off and fall down very slowly. So it's not 0.98 anymore, it's 0.5. And we just return that, meaning that if we're in the game over state, this is the only part, apart from applying velocity, this is the only part of Pinky's game logic that, that happens. This bit, where the jumping and everything isn't going to run. It's a bit sad. Let's see if it works, it doesn't. What's the error? Node is not defined. When I type node, is it in Pinky stream? Do you see node anywhere? Node is not defined. You what? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, sorry. Ah, very crucial, very crucial. You remember the zipper A? What, uh, the second argument uh, to, to the function that goes in, into the scan loop um, takes what comes out of the stream that we're listening to with a scan. And that is no longer just tick. It's, it's um, a zip array of tick and hater streams. So of course, this is where the null comes from, because keys and hater. Oh, and notice, I am doing uh, deconstructing using ECMAScript 6. You can do that now. So essentially what I want to do, um, because I get an array of keys and hater in as an argument, what I'm going to, in JavaScript, one, what I would have to do is, is pick it out. Like um, array index 0 is keys and array index 1 is hater. But the deconstruction syntax, because I know what comes in is, is a list that looks exactly like this, I can just deconstruct that, putting the first element into keys and the second into hater. Very cool. And now it works. And now, presumably, if Pinky hits the hater, she's going to die. So let's try not to do that, shall we? Catch the Dogecoin. And then I think the next one's going to be a bit tricky. There's the hater. And here's the Dogecoin. And this was easier than I thought. I'm just going to crash into the hater. I'll make, make a super jump. <laughs> Oh, I made it. I was going to fail that. OK. It's hard. So jump to catch the coin, and then try and jump. Try and you know, jump on top of him to kill him, right? But no, it kills Pinky. <laughs> and as you can see, that was the game over sequence. And that's enough. Thank you. So yeah, this was my backup in case I screwed up. And that's the end slide. If you want to check out uh, the slides, they are actually on this URL. It will run in your browser with the editor and everything. And as I, I mentioned on the very last slide before the, the Dogecoin animation, uh, this game actually, this is the, the finished game. And if you go to this slide and just go Control S, it runs it in here and you can play. Space makes a jump. Oh, we do have a sound. Now you tell me. OK. So that's the sound. 
And the coin sound. <laughs> That's an echo. Interesting. OK, so, so the game over sound. There you go. OK. Uh, let me get you the URL again. So there it is if you want to check it out online. If you want the source, it's on my GitHub. My GitHub user ID is Bodil. And all right, let's go to the pub. Any questions? Questions. Where did you find that fantastic Dolly mining? <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> Reddit. Probably Reddit, yeah. I don't remember somewhere. But I do love it.